If you want to turn to uh, Genesis, we're in chapter 1 still, verse uh, 14. Lord willing, we'll get to the uh, end of the chapter this morning and just want to uh, set up a, a little video clip that we want to show again from the Ben Stein movie, uh, Expelled. And uh, as we have uh, gone through uh, Genesis and these opening accounts, of course, we uh, uh, have to talk about Darwinian evolution and its uh, uh, lack of evidence, uh, as well as the overwhelming evidence there is for intelligent design. Uh, and with that, then the realization that that Darwinian evolution model certainly contradicts and clashes with uh, what we're reading uh, here in the opening account of the creation of, uh, uh, of the earth. Uh, the problems for um, uh, Darwinian evolution are, are many, and uh, one of them, uh, I'll, I'll point out a few, uh, but uh, this one has to do with the complexity of the cell. Uh, again, for Darwinian evolution model to work, you have to have the ability to get something out of nothing. Uh, there has to be a, a way for a simple protein cell to develop, and uh, when Darwin proposed this theory, uh, and what the clip shows is they knew very little uh, about, they could look through a little microscope and go, yeah, that's a cell down there, but they didn't know a lot more else. Let's go ahead and take a look at the clip. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Darwin wrote uh, The Origin of Species in 1859, published it in 1859. He had an idea of the cell as being quite simple, correct? Darwin. Yeah, everybody did that. Yeah, okay. If he thought of the cell as being a Buick, what is the cell now in terms of its complexity by comparison? A galaxy. A galaxy. A galaxy. A galaxy. What do we now know the cell is? If it's not a lump of jello, what would you compare it to? It's a nano factory. If Darwin thought a cell what do we now know was, say, a mud hut, what do we now know that a cell is? I would say it would be if Darwin thought more complicated a than uh, was, say, the Saturn mud V. Hut. So what is what a cell? What do we now know that a cell is? is now? I would say it would be Darwin never could have imagined. more complicated than uh, the Saturn V. So what is a cell? A world that Darwin never could have imagined. going on, bringing information out from across the cell, opening doors, closing doors, motor molecules, actually motor molecules moving along tracks. It is, it is probably one of the most dynamic physical systems in the universe. We've got this whole automated city. Everything is automated. And, and, it, and it's, I mean, it's, it's a level of nanotechnology which would cause any engineer to drool. It's Broadway <laughs> without the traffic lights. <laughs> See, that, that helps, me, helps me understand why I'm so tired all the time, because there's just all this activity constantly going on within our, uh, within our cells. But uh, it helps us also understand, again, the, the complexity and, and the problems that there are for uh, the idea of uh, Darwinian evolution because of the complexity of the cell. These things could not have come about. Now, we were just uh, at the apologetics conference the last two days, and one of the guest speakers was Dr. William Lane Craig, probably one of the uh, most uh, best-known debaters uh, in, uh, in maybe in the world today, certainly in the United States, brilliant guy, and uh, which makes it difficult to follow his arguments sometimes because they can become pretty complex. But uh, nonetheless, he, was, uh, he quoted a lot of experts uh, in the field and just the chance factor of the idea of, of this all coming about uh, over, over, over time. And of course, that's the, the magic formula for somehow substantiating Darwinian evolution is that, yes, it seems highly improbable, but if we have millions of years, well, let's say billions of years, let's say 50 billion, and so it goes on and on to stretch out the time factor that that somehow is going to make it more reasonable. Now, he quoted uh, more than one scientist there, 
that said the, the probability of this coming about is like one to 100 billion to 100 billion factor. In other words, it's mathematically uh, impossible for the simple cell to develop on its own. And when you look at it, it's like a little city and a machine that all speaks of a, uh, of a designer and what we refer to these days as of intelligent design. Well, that's just one area of a field of study. We'll mention a few as we continue here in verse 14. But remember, uh, it's in the beginning, God creates bara. He creates something out of nothing, which again is, is the problem for uh, the Darwinian model, is that how do you get something out of nothing? But of course, with a Christian worldview, the answer is through God. He, he speaks it into existence. Uh, and then he creates the earth uh, without form and void. And then the following verses uh, explain in the first three days of creation how he brought form to the earth and to the universe. And then in the next three days of creation, how he then fills uh, both of them. And uh, we're in that portion now. God filling the earth, verse 14 of chapter 1. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. It was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from darkness. God saw and God saw that it was good. So evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so and God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So verse 14 to 19, we see the fourth day filled with the two uh, great lights. Now, uh, notice that it does not say that they simply appeared. There, there are those, and again, that try to somehow merge the evolutionary model with creation or the geological ages with creation. Uh, and there's a lot of problems in doing that. And I tried to point out some of the textual reasons for that uh, in our last message. Uh, but they would, uh, it does not say that they appeared because there would be those that say, well, there was the great light on the first day of creation. And we talked about how these things correspond day one and day four, two and five, three and six. Uh, and so they would say, you see, it was always there. God created at the beginning because you've got to have sun. You've got to have the solar system before you can have vegetation that came about on the third day. So they were actually there. Uh, they just didn't appear or we didn't see them yet in terms of the story of creation. But it doesn't say that they appeared. It says they were created. Again, something out of nothing. It really doesn't allow uh, that kind of reasoning. Miam, uh, Miam Loez, a Jewish writer, says, the sun was created after the earth to dispel any notion that the creation of the earth was a natural result of the sun's heat vaporizing the waters. In a similar way, lest anyone contend that plant life is a natural outgrowth of the earth aided by the sun, God created the earth and all of its properties on the third day, and only afterwards on the fourth day did he create the sun to demonstrate unequivocally that everything materialized from God's direct will. God sets it up so that it doesn't fit the evolutionary model. The only way this happens, the only way it works is if God creates uh, everything. I find it interesting that the stars are kind of a throwaway line. He's talking about these two great lights in the creation and uh, yeah, and created the stars, <laughs> those things up there uh, as, as well. Uh, interesting. The 7th century uh, mathematician 
scientist, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, uh, was, a, uh, was a, a, a believer. And uh, he created in his studio uh, an elaborate model of the, of the solar system. And there's a kind of a famous story about him. Uh, and again, it's, he's got the huge orange ball, everything in proportion, the, the Earth, the moon, uh, you know, Venus, you know, the, the planets that uh, they were aware of at that time. And, they, and then he suspends them all, and then he connects them all with a series of gears and belts and cogs so that they, they rotate and move in perfect harmony and perfect timing just they, the way they would in the universe. So the model is there in his, his laboratory, in his studio, and he's working away. And a, a friend comes by one day who's uh, an unbeliever uh, and sees this whole thing for the very first time. And he's, he's amazed and he's enthralled by it, uh, by it all. Uh, and he says, uh, Mr. Newton, what an exquisite thing. Who made it for you? Without looking up, Sir Isaac Newton says, nobody. Nobody, his friend says. That's right. I said nobody. All of these balls and cogs and belts and gears just happened to come together. And wonder of wonders, by chance, they began revolving in their set orbits with perfect timing. <laughs> and of course, he was trying to make his point. If you walk in and you saw a model of the solar system operating, you would have to assume somebody made it. And he's saying, this is nothing compared to that, the thing that uh, uh, we're looking up at. At the um, conference on Friday night, uh, Dr. Craig went through uh, five reasons for the existence of God. And his first one was the cosmological argument, which we kind of covered a lit, little bit in our first couple of messages, and that is that the idea ha that the universe had a beginning. Now, he, he, uh, he mentioned the fact that this uh, idea of the expansion of the universe began in, uh, uh, scientists discovered this in about 1929. And for the next 60 years, they've been trying very hard to disprove that and come up with another theory, because again, if you have the beginning of the universe, You've got to begin or, and that's a real problem for uh, Darwinian uh, uh, evolutionists. Uh, but they have not been able to do it. The universe had a, had a beginning, and we know that because of the expanse uh, that we can tell through our telescopes today of the universe. It's, it's expanding, uh, and so because of that, pretty much every astronomer, physicist around today all agree the universe had a beginning. So that's for your friends that believe in God and you're sharing your faith, that's wonderful. But for your friends that don't believe in God, that's your number one argument. The idea the universe had a beginning, therefore it had to have a beginner. But his second argument that he went through that night was the teleological argument. And that is this thing that Newton is pointing out here. Even though Newton couldn't know what we know today is that the universe is incredibly fine-tuned. And of course, if the moon was a little further away, our tides would overrun us. If the earth wasn't on a perfect 23 degree slant, uh, then uh, we would have problems uh, having life on this planet. If the sun was a little closer, if the sun was any further away. And this goes, those are basic. This goes on and on and on. That within the laws of nature, like gravity and so forth, there are constants that must remain within all of them. And all of this says that the universe is incredibly fine tuned. And if it wasn't, life could not exist. Uh, and the whole point there is the fact that the chance factor for all of this to come together is uh, just beyond any kind of probability. Sometimes uh, uh, to explain probability is simply by saying if I took 10 pennies and I wrote one through 10 on them, I dropped them in my pocket. If I took, for me to reach in and pull out penny mark number one would be one in 10. If I dropped it back in my pocket, for me to pick out number two, that would be one in a hundred. For me to follow the sequence and pick out three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, the chance factor is one in ten billion. Now we're just talking about a sequence of ten. We start talking about the complexity of the cell, the fine tuning of the universe. Uh, it's, uh, I think, one of the uh, uh, quotes from Dr. Craig. Uh, one. One person said, a mathematician, it's like 1 to 10 billion to 10 billion to 10 billion. It's just beyond uh, any kind of mathematical probability of all of this coming about all on its own. The sheer design of the, of the solar system. The uh, Sir Isaac Newton, 
uh, who designed and uh, was amazed by the beauty of our solar system at one point in time said, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And again, Christianity is not opposed to science. It is the foundation for science and for scientific thought. Uh, and uh, it's uh, just amazing to, uh, to view. The, uh, the natural laws work because Christ ordained them. Look at verse 17 again. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. In verse 18, and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. So light on earth separating the day and night and certainly marking out this issue of calculation and calendars. Uh, that uh, most ancient calendars were lunar, including the uh, Jewish calendar. And so when the sun came into a certain position, it was to remind them it was time to worship the Lord. It's there for signs and seasons. And the primary thing is there is to give us light so we can function, but to remind us that God's there. Every time the sun comes up, it's because God brought it up. Every time it sets, every time we see the stars uh, out there, every time we see a planet in the sky and we marvel at it, it's not only to remind us of God's majesty and his power, it's to remind us that we should worship him. The psalmist in 136 verse 7 says, To him who made great lights, his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. That's a wonderful thought, isn't it? Not just to remember God's power and creation, but to remember when we see these things, and his mercy endures forever. It should make us want to, uh, to worship him, and that's the idea. The word seasons here occurs 200 times in the Jewish Bible in the Old Testament, and half of those times it's reference to worship or worshiping God, set in the heavens for seasons and for a time. Uh, on day five, God filled the waters and the sky, verse 20 to 23. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the water is abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So God divides the primeval waters and, uh, and fills them, and again, uh, day one uh, corresponds with four, two with five, and three with six. Uh, and here, the, again, the mention of he creates them and says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea. Each species is created uh, fully mature so that it can reproduce uh, instantly. Uh, and then again, sometimes we, uh, uh, even I use the uh, really not the best statement to say he created things with age in them, but it, it's just that he created them fully mature. We sometimes want to say there's age into them because we've been told so long that the universe is, is so old and has all of this age, as though we have two universes to look at, one that's young, one that's old. We can make a comparison and therefore say that ours is old, but uh, uh, it's just kind of an indoctrination. But uh, So we don't really say that the universe was created with age per se, but everything that was created was in its species, and then it was created fully mature. We see that with the plants as well. Fruit in them with seeds, we see man and woman created fully mature as, uh, as well. We don't see, again, this is contradictory to the evolutionary uh, model. Uh, and God blessing them, telling them to be fruitful and multiply. Now, most of these things are pretty straightforward. It's very interesting, the monsters of, of the deep. We have one of them mentioned in the Bible. His name is Leviathan. Sounds very much, as you hear his description, uh, like uh, a dinosaur, like a plerosaurus in particular. In Job, Job again questioning, debating with God. And God says to him in Job 41.12, I will not conceal his limbs, speaking about Leviathan. By the way, some commentators believe that this is a description of an alligator, 
or crocodile, you tell me if this sounds like that's what's being described. His mighty power or his graceful proportions. Who can remove his outer coat? Who can approach him with a double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? His rows of scales are his pride, shut up tightly as with a seal. One is so near the other that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together and cannot be parted. He sneezes, flash forth light, and his eyes are like eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot in a burning rushes. Doesn't sound like a crocodile to me. And... Um, and again, part of the, uh, uh, the issue with this is that uh, uh, we have a, a plethora of uh, fossils around the world. And one of the great things to, uh, if you have the opportunity to visit a natural history, history museum, uh, which is uh, great, we've been able to visit a few, uh, but uh, is they usually have the reconstruction of the fossils of these great dinosaurs. But the contention is that they lived billions and billions of years ago, never had any interaction with men. And yet we have this account here, uh, which contradicts that, and we have accounts from other, other people groups around the world that describe creatures like this. I guess none of those people ever got the memo that they didn't live at the same time as these great creatures, but they're, they're created from the beginning. I, uh, I have to uh, confess this. I was doing a uh, stained glass windows, uh, a series of windows for St. Mary's Episcopal Church in, uh, in Honolulu and there in Boile Ely one time. And they wanted, among other things, a, a window of uh, Noah's Ark. Sometimes the donor will prescribe a theme or a particular verse. And happy to accommodate that. And, and I did a window of, um, of uh, after the flood, the uh, Ark has come to rest there on Mount Arat, and uh, Noah and his family, as you recall the story, are gathered around, and they're, they're sacrificing, they're worshiping the Lord and thanking him for their deliverance and, uh, and so forth, and coming through it all, and, and silhouetted in the background is, a, uh, is kind of a gangplank with uh, animals coming off in the twos, and I threw in a couple of dinosaurs <laughs> coming off the, uh, uh, the ark. Yeah, but uh, nonetheless, we have these uh, eyewitness uh, uh, accounts of them, we have the description of the great sea creatures as well as those that are on the land here as, as well. On day six, God filled the earth with animate life. Uh, and again, day three, the corresponding day, dry ground was caused to appear covered with vegetation. And now we have land creatures. Uh, I think these are merely genetic categories. Cattle or livestock would indicate domestic animals. Creeping things certainly would include geckos. I don't care if they sell insurance or not. <laughs> Creatures that move along the ground signifying small animals and insects. And then the beast, which would again include behemoth, described uh, in the Old Testament as well, and other wild animals. And, uh, and certainly we're never to worship these creatures as the pantheists do, but we do worship the creator of the material world. And uh, God creates this uh, environment again on these parallel corresponding uh, days. And it's, uh, it's amazing. But what happens here now is the narrative completely slows down as we come to the creation of, uh, of man itself. And just to reiterate, because I think I need to keep doing that, what the Bible says here and what I'm not saying is that there are not evolutionary processes that have been in work. There are, and there are forms of them and transitions of them of one species changing to adapt itself to an environment. I used to show people that were not aware of it when I would hold up my 100-pound golden retriever and spread his little toes about and show his webbed feet and how what a good swimmer he was. I wasn't doing that because I thought he came from a duck. No, I just thought that, uh, you know, animals like dogs, each is created in their kind and able to multiply. And there is environmental adaptation over time, but that's not a jump from one species to the next. So we see that certainly in, uh, in animal life uh, as well. That's not what the Bible is saying. It's saying that God created these uh, each in their kind fully formed. No transitional forms, nor have we ever found any. Uh, verse 26, now God fills the earth with man. Very different. Then God said, let us make man in our image 
According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said... See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you it shall be for food, also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the six days. So man's created by God. And of course, uh, Darwin evolution uh, denies this creation, man being created in the image of God. Rather, it says that we are derived or come from apes or chimpanzees. Now, uh, the reason they do this is because of the similarities. Uh, we are both created out of the dust of the ground, certainly, uh, but we eat the same kinds of foods, the same carbohydrates, fat, proteins, vitamins, minerals, salts, and waters. Our bodies have the same general makeup and function. Our metabolic processes are both almost identical, and our blood groups are the same. So there are similarities, and because those are similarities, and because there's a denial of the intelligent designer, uh, then they make the link. And it's been uh, the pursuit uh, of scientists, anthropologists in particular, uh, for a number of years now, ever since Darwin, to try to find that ape man somehow transitional species that show there's some connection with us. And there's been many that they've come up with. And if you go again to a natural history museum, you'll see all of these models, you know, and you even see it, uh, I think it's on my surfboard leash or somewhere, you know, you, you see the, uh, the, the ape, the monkey, the, you know, getting, walking more upright and of course finally able to surf, you know, because that's the ultimate evolution uh, in the surfing world. But, uh, it's either on my surfboard deck or my leash or somewhere. But uh, uh, none, nonetheless, uh, we don't really find those. What we do find, what has been discovered, is a portion of a skull and a portion of a tooth and, uh, and so forth. I remember when I was uh, taking anthropology and, uh, at uh, Cal State Hayward, and I'm you know, 20 years old, I'm listening to the guy, it's a PhD, and he's describing uh, the latest discovery from Louis Leakey or somebody, and the, and the jaw bone and the ankle bone that they found, and it's okay if they're from two different continents, but they're very similar, so we're gonna bring them together. Because if we have the tooth, like the Nebraska man, for example, if we have the tooth, then we know what the jaw looked like. If we know what the jaw looked like, then we can know what the head looks like. And if we know what the head looks like, we'll know what the neck and the body looks like. If we know what that all looks like, we know what the, the, uh, the uh, muscle uh, on, on it would look like. Then we would know what the skin on it, and then we would know what the, and if we had the male, we would have the female. If we had both of them, we would know what their children looked like. We would know what kind of village they lived in. We would know their, what they hunted like, and we would know their migration habits. And as a 20 year old, I thought that was amazing. That was like the smartest guy I've ever heard in my life. You know, it's like, I don't know how you got there, but that is amazing. And they had pictures and video clips, and it was just an amazing. Uh, the, the problem is, if you think about it, that's quite a stretch. Did I mention Nebraska man turned out to be a pig's tooth? So that kind of washed that one out. And that's the problem with some of these things. Uh, they, they, some of them have some validity in terms of, uh, you know, what are they exactly? But some of them have been outright frauds. Uh, others that was found, one was uh, in a large skull. They thought they had something that turned out to be a guy with, with rickets, and, uh, and I could go on and on. But just to, to quote, uh, again, uh, Lewis, uh, uh, Richard Leakey, excuse me, uh, he says that until we find complete skeletons of ape man creatures, we will have to rely on inspirational guess. There's real science, inspirational guess. They just, they don't have it. They can find a portion of a skull, a portion of this, and somehow bring them together, and the rest is, is purely imagination. Uh, and one of the things that uh, disturbs me in going to uh, some of the museums, that some of the ones that I've, that I've read about that have now been discredited, they're still there. 
uh, and they're still in the textbooks. And there's never a rebuttal that we blew it on this one, we're sorry, and it's, it's never pulled, or there's never a redoing the textbook. They're still in assumption, and people assume that when you talk about these Cro-Magnon man, Nebraska man, Peltnow man, and all these things that I studied back, back uh, years ago, shortly after they, uh, they were off the scene, uh, that, uh, that they're still out there and still valid uh, examples when, uh, when they're actually not. And, uh, and somebody like Richard, Richard Leakey, uh, uh, one of the great anthropologists of our time, uh, admits that you need to find this transitional form. Uh, and it's just not there. You can read more about some great books out there on the fossil uh, record. But uh, again, the biblical account suggests that uh, Adam and Eve are created, of course, from the hand of God and were, would have been brilliant in their intelligence. They would have been perfect examples of man and woman in terms of their physical ab abilities and physique because the fall had not come, sin had not come, death and the degeneration of the genetic code had not been uh, disrupted in terms of what God meant it to be in terms of man living as eternal creatures and so forth. Uh, and so what you get sometimes when you see shows on the History Channel or Discovery Channel, whatever it might be, is, is secrets of the ancient man or mysteries of the ancient man. And what those shows are going to be about is the discovery of how brilliant ancient man was and how he had the ability. He knew about electricity. They had batteries. They had this. They had that. And it's amazing. Why is it amazing? Because we think that ancient man was like the guy on the, on the Geico commercial. Even a caveman can do it. I mean, you're as stupid as a caveman, and yet you still can go online in 15 minutes, save at least 15% on your car insurance. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's going under this assumption that these men were... Uh, were, were the cave men. Very interesting, some of, the, some of the cave drawings that they point to uh, when examined find out that the guys are wearing pants and boots and pretty much look like people today under closer examination. So it's this fallacy that, that man was, was uh, you know, this Neanderthal and he's getting smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter and until you arrive at the brilliant people that we are today. But uh, that's not necessarily the, the case. That's not what we find in uh, in history as well. Uh, the other thing about this very importantly is as the text kinds of slows down in its narrative, we have the first use of, in a sense, a poetical form. Now the whole thing is written in a narrative just like history and the rest uh, of, the, uh, of uh, Moses' writing. But when it comes to this line of let us make man in our image according to our likeness, uh, it changes here uh, to a third person uh, from a third person to a first person, plural, uh, and we really have a glimmer or the idea uh, of the Trinity. Now, we mentioned that in the beginning, God created, that's the word Elohim. Uh, Moses could have used the term El, God, uh, singular, but instead he uses the term for God, plural. Uh, Jewish writers would say it was to emphasize the majesty of God uh, as New Testament or New Covenant believers. We believe it's speaking about the Trinity and then we have that echoed here again. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And some would say, well, isn't he God speaking to the angels? No, man was not made in the image of angels. He was made in the image of God. That's the whole point, and that's what's reiterated in other places. This has incredible ramifications if we understand it. Let me just read this quote from uh, Kent Hughes. I think helps put it in context. Again, the point is the creation of man, everything slows down in the focus of God because this is the apex of creation itself. Ken Hughes writes, so consider this, though you could travel 100 times the speed of light past countless yellow-orange stars to the edge of the galaxy and swoop down to the fiery glow located a few hundred light years below the plane of the Milky Way, though you could slow down to examine the host of hot young stars luminous among the gas and dust, Though you could observe close up the protostars poised to burst forth from their dusty cocoons, though you could witness a star's birth in all your stellar journeys, you would never see anything equal to the birth and wonder of a human being. For a tiny baby girl or boy is the apex of God's creation. But the greatest wonder of all is that the child is created in the image of God, the imagio Dei, 
The child once was not, now as a created soul, he or she is eternal. He or she will exist forever. When the stars of the universe fade away, that soul shall live. And that's why if you've ever witnessed the birth of a child, and especially your own, you go, that was a miracle. That was incredible. That was awesome. And that's what God says. You could see the birth of a star. You could travel through the universe. But he says it's, it's all pale in reflection. Again, even when he mentions the stars, it's like a throwaway line. It's like, yeah, and the stars are created too. Let me tell you about something that's really important. And he begins to talk about the creation of man and woman. And we have, the, have them created, notice, our image, our likeness. The two words are synonymous, uh, quality shared by God and, uh, and man. And uh, uh, somebody asked Dr. Craig, I think on Saturday afternoon after one of his sessions, again, uh, given all the evidence for intelligent design uh, that's out there, not only in terms of the cosmological uh, argument, he went through four or five of uh, the teleological argument uh, and, uh, uh, and later several others, and, uh, and as well as we look at the uh, discovery and, and looking into the, uh, the cell itself and its complexity, he says, do you think intelligent design will ever gain traction enough so that it becomes the dominant view within the scientific community? And that was the question. Uh, and uh, Dr. Craig says, no, I don't think so. I think it will always be the minority view simply because it is a sliver between intelligent design and the designer who is God. Uh, because if we have a God who created everything, then he created us as persons. He must be personal as well. And since he's built into every person a moral code, he must be a moral and good God. And if he's a moral and good God, then he's a moral law giver. And if he's a moral law giver, then every person will have to give an account of their lives morally to that God one day. And from that belief to intelligent design, he says, it's, it's a sliver. Uh, and therefore, there will be just some that will refuse, regardless of the evidence that's out there, to ever hold that view. That's really what it comes down to. But that's what's so important for us to understand. Because God created us. We're created in his image. Uh, there's several things that are important. Now, most commentators and, and uh, e even early church writers said that what was shared between God and man was our spiritual qualities. But there's so much more than just simply that, although that is so important that we can worship God in spirit and in truth. We have a capacity for self-consciousness, uh, for speech, for moral discernment. We can think, we can feel, we have emotions, we can make decisions, we can exercise free will. We have the ability to think about the future and the past, to make plans, and then to evaluate them. All of this separates us quite distinctively from the animal world. And again, according to the Darwinian evolution model, we are simply more advanced animals. We've got a better nervous system, but really there's not much difference between us and them. But uh, this view is very different, and it's created quite, quite a bit of problems in our own culture and our society. For example, the issue of the sanctity of life. If you believe that every person, every, every baby is made in the image of God, then sanctity of life becomes very critical and very important to you. And again, this is not just a view that was held at creation and not held again. It's held after the fall, after the flood, and it's held in the New Testament as well. Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made him. Why should there be punishment? Why is murder always wrong? It is because we are made in the image of God. Again, the apostle uh, James understood this, and he says in James 3, 8, But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. The image of God persists. doesn't matter if it's sinful man after the fall, after the flood, we're still made in the image of God. Uh, issues like outcome-based education and the issue of self-esteem within our educational system. Uh, again, we for several generations have told uh, young people and children that they are here as a matter of accident, that they exist on a tiny particle uh, in a little dust particle that's part of the Milky Way galaxy 
their life doesn't matter. It won't matter. In the end, it will all end. And that big star in the sky that we call the sun will eventually burn out itself. There is no meaning, there is no purpose, and there is no hope in their lives other than doing the best they can, enjoy themselves, or whatever they want to do with their lives. But there's really no reason to get up and even go to work the next day. That's what we've taught them. That's the philosophy we've taught them. And it's had repercussions. As a result, we've now instituted a whole teaching about self-esteem. <laughs> is it any wonder that we need it? But that's not what we need. People need to see and understand they were made in the uh, in the image of God. I remember the the first season after I coached Pony League baseball, one of the team's moms came to me and said, uh, <clears throat> and said, "Hey, Coach Tim, we're going to have our you know banquet thing at the end. We'll do pizza. We'll do stuff for the kids. And and uh, do you want to order the trophies or do you want me to order the trophies?" And I said, "What are we ordering trophies for? We didn't win anything." <laughs> Oh, well, every kid gets a trophy. I go, what do you mean every kid gets a trophy? How does every kid get a trophy? You mean like the best offensive player, the best defense, the best improve, that kind of thing? Reward the kids that work the hardest kind of trophy? No, every kid gets a trophy. Every kid, yeah, every kid in the whole league gets a trophy. Well, what are we talking about here? And she shows me the trophy. It's a pretty good trophy for just showing up. <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, man, what? And it's because we've got to make sure everybody feels good about themselves. When I was a kid, uh, I was one of the few uh, in the Little League that actually played on a team but won a championship. What did I get? I got a pin about that big to go on my hat. It was my prized possession. Made the All-Stars. You got a pin about that big with the Little League insignia. That was it. Uh, Josh later played on a team that won a championship. He got a trophy. He was almost as tall as he was. I mean, it was, and every kid on his team did. It was ridiculous. But again, it's just this, when we move away from this position, very important, that we are created, imagio Dei, in the image of God. We're all image bearers of God. It was a, a young Protestant minister that had this world view that, uh, that stood on the steps of the Washington Monument on an occasion and said that he had a dream when all God's children would be able to live together. Martin Luther King Jr. That's a Christian worldview that was the foundation for the civil rights movement. Everybody is made in the image of God. And we've lost this in our culture. And there's been uh, tremendous repercussions as a result. Secondly, man is not only made in the image of God, he's created to be hearing God. Notice verse 28. And God said to them. This means that the image bearers can hear and receive God's word no other creature can do that. Of course, this also means that we are now responsible, moral, spiritual beings. It also says that man would, was created to be ruling for God. And, uh, and certainly we are familiar with this concept of what we'll do in the future uh, as New Testament believers. But Psalm 8, 3 says, When I consider your heavens the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him. For you made him a little lower than the angels, and you've crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Now again, the fall comes in, but we're still called to be stewards of what he's given us. We're called to rule and reign. These are all things that Christ has redeemed, uh, that we've lost, and he will bring to us once again. And uh, most importantly as well, then man is created to be the sons of God. Or again, we would say sons and daughters. But elsewhere in Genesis, we see more about this idea of the image of God. And there's a direct link. Because we're made in the image of God, we are the sons and the daughters of God. Made in his image, made in his, in his likeness. One writer put it this way. Image bearers can hear God's word and write it to untold spiritual heights. Image bearers are innately regal, being meant to rule over all creation. Image bearers are the created offspring of God with real possibilities of eternal sonship. So when we say that man is the apex of God's creation, that's what we're talking about. The next time you marvel at a sunset, notice the beauty of those waterfalls as they were the other day pouring over the koolows of you as you head up uh, Haiku Valley on H3 and you marvel at it all, it's nothing compared to you God, in God's eyes. And we've begun to miss that in our culture, and it's created problems for us. 
uh, in terms of the way we look at each other, deal with each other, our educational systems, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's really a shame. Uh, notice that, of course, the last thing, because of that, this idea of the fall does come in, God's earth is filled with fallen man. But even in that, God comes to redeem. And we'll look as we get to chapter 3 more about this idea of the fall of mankind. But what awaits us? We are meant to be created in God's image, and God comes and sends his son so that we might be recreated in the image of God in terms of the image of Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? We with all unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. God's Spirit wants to create in us so that it would be obvious, more obvious, that we are imagio Dei, the image of God. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 47. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. As, as is the heavenly man, so also are are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. We will be like Jesus one day. Truly that image restored, but we're all made in the image of God. Blaise Pascal, uh, probably uh, maybe some would say the greatest mathematician that's ever lived, certainly the father of modern mathematics, uh, says this about this idea of being made in the image of God. He says, The infinite abyss can only be filled by an infinite and immutable object, that is to say, only by God himself. He only is our true good. And since we have forsaken him, it is a strange thing that there is nothing in nature which has not been serviceable in taking his place. Pasquale says there's a vacuum inside of our hearts because of the fall. Uh, there, we would say in our vernacular, there's a God-shaped void that only God can fill. And that's what this great thinker uh, of several centuries ago said, that it needs to be immutable. It can't be changing, and it needs to be infinite because it's an infinite desire that he's placed within our heart. Only God can fill it. So our question, of course, is will we bring our emptiness to Christ? That's that's what God desires us to do, that he might fill it. Remember at the end of the message last week, because God brought form and he filled the universe, he still wants to do that in our own lives today, to, to bring meaning and purpose and to fill us. Because there's a need for forgiveness, there's a need for righteousness, and there's need, a need for a relationship with the God that created us. But when we dispute dismiss and diminish these opening chapters, we find ourselves, even as believers, in real trouble. That's why they become so foundational and so critical that we might have that Christian worldview, that we might see everybody made in the image of God, everybody that we would care about. That's why we can <coughs> call other people brothers and sisters, because what God has done in and through our lives to help us see again what he meant from the beginning as he created us.